Good afternoon, everybody. I am so delighted to welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, my name is Cara Carter. I'm the Senior Vice President for Strategy and Programs at the California Healthcare Foundation. We're joined by many colleagues and guests today, some of whom are familiar with CHCF and some of whom may not be. For those of you who don't know us, we're an independent nonprofit philanthropy and we're dedicated to making California's healthcare system work for all Californians, particularly those with low incomes and those whose needs are not well served by the status quo. So why are we talking about a federal election today? So first I would say California is a big state. Let's acknowledge that we have a lot of ability to drive our own destiny. On our own, we represent the fifth largest economy in the world and more than a 10th of the US population. That said, it's also true that much of what happens in California depends on the decisions that are made by the federal government. By many measures, it's fair to say that the 2020 federal election has been one of the most consequential elections of our lifetime. We know that Californians care deeply about healthcare. In our own polling, CHCF has consistently seen the vast majority of Californians saying that issues like universal coverage, affordability, and mental health are very or extremely important to them. Nine out of 10 Californians believe Medi-Cal is important to the state. And strong majorities of Californians are also worried about the pandemic. We have by and large made incredible sacrifices at home, at work, and in our communities to prevent deaths from COVID-19. These healthcare issues are, that are most top of mind for Californians are also closely linked to the healthcare policies and priorities that are set in Washington, DC. So earlier this month, President-elect Joe Biden was declared the winner of the election and President-elect Joe Biden will be inaugurated on January 20th, 2021. It is clear that a Biden administration will bring a very different set of priorities and values to federal healthcare policy. And it's not too early to familiarize ourselves with federal landscape for health policy including what can and can't be done by the executive branch alone and what can be done by a closely divided Congress. So for today's event, I'm especially pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Billy Wynn. Many of you are familiar with Billy through the indispensable analysis of federal healthcare policy that he offers regularly through our blog. In just a moment, I'm gonna hand things over to my colleague, Katie Rodriguez, our Associate Director for State Health Policy. And she'll give a fuller introduction to Billy and she'll lead today's discussion. But before I do that, I have just a little bit of housekeeping. So I wanna let everyone know how to post questions for the Q&A portion of our briefing. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen anytime during the presentation to submit questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can later on in the webinar. And I wanna put in a huge plug for folks to fill out the evaluation form. It will appear in your browser after the webinar ends. So thank you again for joining us today. And with that, I'm gonna hand to Katie. Thank you, Cara. And I'd like to add my welcome. Um, we are delighted to have everybody here today. Um, I'm happy to introduce Billy Wynn, who is the chairman of the Wynn Health Group and was previously Health Policy Counsel to the US Senate Finance Committee. As Cara mentioned, we've had the pleasure to work with Billy through the federal analysis and updates on federal health policy happenings he and his team provide. You can find the rest of his bio on CHCF's website. Today, Billy will provide an overview of the possibilities for federal health policy next year. For more details, you can also read his issue brief, which can be found on our website. After his presentation, I will ask a few questions and then we will take questions from the audience. I will now turn it over to Billy. Thank you very much, Katie and Kara um, and uh, the California Healthcare Foundation for having me today. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be with you. And I'll go through the slides uh, relatively quickly to make sure that we have a lot of time for a question and answer and discussion. As Kara mentioned, um, in case you have been asleep since November 3rd, we had a bit of an election. Uh, Joe Biden um, has won 306 electoral votes uh, as it stands today. Uh, there are of course some disputes about uh, votes in some states, uh, but as Kara said, uh, we expect and are certainly planning for Joe Biden to be inaugurated on January 20. Um, and we believe that uh, uh, we'll land there uh, securely uh, after perhaps a bit of turbulence. But I think we can all safely be preparing for uh, that to happen. Why don't we move on to the next slide, please? So with Congress, uh, things are, are uh, interesting. Um, the House uh, tightened uh, with Republicans netting some seats there. Um, actually, just this morning, uh, House Speaker Pelosi was reelected 
uh, as was uh, Majority Leader Steny Hoyer and Majority Whip uh, James Clyburn from South Carolina. Uh, so um, the Democrats uh, still uh, maintain control of the House, uh, but did lose some seats uh, in those in uh, the elections we just uh, went through. In the Senate, we have two uh, runoffs in Georgia, and um, uh, that uh, runoff could uh, determine whether or not we have a, a uh, compliant or uh, uh, non-cooperative uh, Senate for President-elect Joe Biden. Um, we expect that that uh, race uh, will likely uh, uh, probably wind up in one party's favor or the other in toto. It's highly unlikely that this, the uh, that uh, we'll see a split decision between those two runoffs. Uh, but either way, suffice it to say, we're going to have a very evenly divided uh, Senate that President-elect Biden is going to need to work with. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. So here are uh, the uh, President-elect Biden's top healthcare priorities. Uh, he began to articulate these with some detail over the summer and has reiterated them uh, repeatedly on the campaign trail and since his uh, election. Um, first and foremost, it goes without saying that COVID-19 and uh, the government's response to that is number one on his healthcare agenda, probably number one on his agenda overall. Uh, and he has begun to identify leaders that he intends to uh, put in place in a COVID-19 task force. Uh, and I think very soon we'll start to see uh, cabinet level positions being uh, identified. Uh, those will of course need to be confirmed by the Senate. Uh, and also he's beginning as he has with his chief of staff uh, Ron Klain begun to identify some of his key White House advisors, and those are going to be the folks uh, who are going to be taking the lead uh, with him in uh, trying to uh, address the COVID-19 pandemic and taking a, a break uh, or departure from uh, what we've seen for the past four years. We'll go into that in more detail in a moment. Uh, some of these other items uh, will be familiar to you, and we'll go into them in better detail. Um, but uh, the overarching theme that I want to emphasize here is that uh, President-elect Biden's ability to deliver on his campaign promises on these priorities is dependent on a lot of factors that are out of his control. Uh, the, the degree to which Congress uh, will cooperate uh, and other factors like COVID-19 and the lingering Affordable Care Act Supreme Court case, uh, all of which we'll talk about more soon. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide, please. So with regard to those pathways in particular, uh, we wanna talk a little bit about the, the technical parameters that they entail. And we could spend the whole time talking about this and I won't do that, uh, but suffice it, to, suffice it to say, to level set, uh, to pass what we might call standard or just regular legislation uh, through the Congress, you uh, need to overcome the potential for a Senate filibuster and that requires 60 votes uh, to move forward. So in other words, you cannot get to the merits of a bill without a 60 vote majority in the Senate with some exceptions that I will speak to. Um, an alternative to that is the budget reconciliation process. And to, uh, effect to pass legislation through budget reconciliation, you first need to pass a budget resolution, which can pass by a simple majority vote uh, in the House and Senate. Um, you then need to follow on that budget resolution with substantive measures, the predominant impact of which is budgetary. So items need to either spend uh, federal funding to a substantial degree or uh, save or reduce uh, federal spending to a substantial degree. Uh, the impact on the budget cannot be incidental. So you cannot pass uh, broader policies. One good example of this is um, protecting people with pre-existing conditions. There are budgetary implications of that, uh, but we know that the Senate parliamentarian who is the ultimate arbiter of whether or not provisions qualify for reconciliation or not, finds policies like that uh, to have only an incidental impact on the budget and therefore they are not permissible in a budget reconciliation context. Uh, another legislative measure is the Congressional Review Act. If you have a cooperative Congress, um, that is aligned with the president in reversing or revising previous regulations uh, from a prior administration, then you can pass a Congressional Review Act, Congressional Review Act bill through a simple majority vote um, of the House and Senate, and that can um, block or reverse or revise uh, existing regulations that a prior administration has enacted. Look back period for that is a bit complicated of a formula, 
but I think for practical purposes, you can think of it as about a six month window uh, that a, a new Congress and a new administration can look back at a prior administration's regulations to revise those through a CRA uh, process. Uh, notice and comment rulemaking is your standard fare uh, federal regulation typically uh, spawned by a proposal, a 60 to 90 day period of comment, and then a finalization of that proposal. There are other varieties of rulemaking, uh, such as uh, an interim final rule where you put the rule in place and, and uh, comments are made after that. Um, but that is going to be a key pathway for President-elect Joe Biden to move forward with his agenda. Uh, there are also, as we have seen, and I'm including executive orders in this bucket of sub-regulatory guidance. So um, this can include things like uh, educational materials that the Medicare and Medicaid offices might put out. Um, or new policies that come out of the FDA are often done through um, sub-regulatory guidance. It's been an increasingly popular method for the executive branch to effectuate policy. There have been legal questions about whether or not uh, policies implemented through those channels, in particular recently the use of executive orders, um, can stand uh, in the face of a judicial challenge. Um, I suspect that uh, President Biden, elect Biden, at least with regard to executive orders, you'll see a more restrained approach uh, that um, is more in um, furthering existing statutory authority rather than trying to depart from existing statutory authority um, in lieu of enacting new legislation. We'll talk more about waivers in a minute. So let's move on to the next slide in the interest of time. So going back then to the, uh, the COVID response, um, here, I think that the simple rule of thumb is that if you're talking about moving a significant amount of dollars uh, in one direction or another relating to COVID-19, you are going to need congressional support. Uh, of course, we have seen that negotiations primarily between uh, House Speaker Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin um, have been going on since before the election. They, at least on paper, continue to today. Uh, Majority Leader McConnell has taken a more prominent role in negotiating on behalf of Republicans. And while we um, hold out hope for a broad-based COVID-19 relief package in the lame duck period, which is scheduled to go into December, uh, it is going to be challenging to do that, especially with the ongoing dispute over the outcome of the election. There are a variety of things that President-elect Biden can do through regulatory means to address the COVID-19 pandemic, including uh, at least two uh, sources of statutory-based emergency authority uh, with the Defense Production Act and also the National Emergencies Act. One example that we saw with the NEA or National Emergencies Act was loosening of Medicare restrictions on telehealth services uh, so that uh, more people, including those who aren't based in rural areas, could avail themselves of uh, remote medical services, uh, obviously due to social distancing measures for the COVID pandemic. Um, Let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, so uh, outside of COVID-19, uh, I think it, Joe Biden's uh, second priority uh, is expanding coverage and strengthening the Affordable Care Act. He, of course, was in the White House when the Affordable Care Act was passed. He is a uh, believer in it. He is not one who thinks that we should replace it or deviate from it in a meaningful way. He wants to strengthen it and build on it. And uh, Kamala Harris is aligned with him in that regard. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a number of measures that will re require congressional action. Uh, many of these uh, could be adopted at quick glance, all of them uh, could potentially be adopted through reconciliation if you have a cooperative Congress, and this is vitally important. Um, if you have a non-cooperative uh, Senate, for example, uh, it can bar these measures even coming to the floor for a vote. Uh, so um, even if there theoretically you could uh, find a bipartisan majority, for example, um, to enact uh, some of these measures, um, if the Senate overall is not cooperative, then those measures would not even see the light of day and would not be enacted. Uh, I wanted to mention one item in particular relative to the pending Affordable Care Act lawsuit. Many of us may have tuned in or certainly read press reports about the oral arguments. Uh, it is hazardous to, to interpret too much from those, but I think overall, I, I agree with the, the headlines that we saw that generally it was uh, favorable with regard to the rest of the Affordable Care Act standing, whatever may happen to the individual mandate provision. Um, and that uh, nonetheless, you will probably see an effort 
um, by some to uh, enact measures, for example, by strengthening the uh, enforcement mechanism for the individual mandate, which is the elimination of that is at the root of the lawsuit as a preemptive measure uh, to uh, whatever the Supreme Court might be inclined to do to protect the Affordable Care Act. I think that given the, the close divide in the Senate and the House as well, uh, that moving a measure like that before the Supreme Court renders its decision, probably sometime, well, certainly by June, uh, but maybe not until then, uh, moving a measure, a preemptive measure to protect the ACA, ACA is going to be extremely difficult. Um, on the right side, I want to address the waiver uh, issue because um, uh, I said I would come back to it, and it is going to be a vital pathway for uh, President Biden, uh, President-elect Biden, to effectuate his health care policy agenda. And here in particular, I want to note uh, under the Obama administration, you saw um, a, a federal waivers primarily used for uh, reinsurance under 1332 of the Affordable Care Act, um, and also a variety of Medicaid oriented waivers and those the 1332 waivers for primarily oriented toward the exchange and what we call 1115 waivers for Medicaid are really going to be the primary tools that um, uh, states have to uh, implement coverage expansion, other policy change, stabilizing their markets in the absence of federal legislation and, and really federal leadership um, because of what is going to be probably a very divided and um, unfortunately tumultuous uh, two years in Washington. Uh, so with that, why don't we move on to the next slide? Health equity is a, is a huge priority for President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris. Um, uh, with uh, the uh, death of George Floyd and the protests over the summer and the national attention and perhaps awakening to racial injustice, uh, we know that President-elect Biden and his administration plan to address these issues as best they can. There are a variety of levers for doing that through regulatory and administrative channels. Um, and in particular, and with regard to healthcare, the, um, the emblems of racial inequity are, are riddled throughout our system. I think that's fairly well known among this crowd, things like maternal mortality, mortality metrics in general, access to care, you go down the list and you see racial inequity. So uh, I believe that President-elect Biden is gonna be putting leaders in place that understand these issues and will focus on them um, and that they will uh, make proposals to Congress to move forward to try to address some of these inequities, but they're gonna probably be falling back primarily on their uh, regulatory and waiver authority to try to address these issues at least in the next two years. Next slide, please. So there are a host of, of other issues, um, uh, healthcare related items that are on President-elect Biden's agenda. And there are some that um, we believe could well be accomplished through legislation. Um, others, we're probably going to see more of an emphasis on uh, regulation and executive authority. Drug pricing is an interesting issue because we saw uh, President Trump really break with Republican orthodoxy in terms of uh, promoting stronger, uh, a stronger role for government in establishing drug prices, uh, which has been a, a hallmark of a Democrat uh, platform for many years. Um, and so, but even then, um, we saw that it was difficult both for Congress and for the Trump administration to implement aggressive drug pricing policies. And I think that that trend is going to continue uh, regardless of the outcome of uh, the Senate and what you, what you ultimately see in terms of the makeup of Congress, uh, because um, uh, there is a, uh, 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 it's difficult uh, to move aggressive cost control measures through Congress, both with regard to drug pricing, and also for things like surprise billing, uh, which on its face is a very uh, popular uh, uh, issue to address, and a very unpopular phenomenon of people getting uh, large medical bills from hospitals that they did not accept or expect, excuse me. Um, and yet even there, uh, with uh, many members of Congress on both sides of the aisle working for years now trying to address that issue, we have not seen comprehensive uh, surprise billing legislation moved through. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, immigration uh, because that is also high priority for, for President-elect Biden. I know an important issue for California. Um, there are, as many of you are probably well aware, statutory barriers to uh, immigrants enrolling in a variety of federal healthcare programs. And removing those on a long-term basis is going to require congressional action. 
On the other hand, um, there were measures in, adopted during the Trump administration through executive power, such as the public charge rule, which is still at dispute in the federal courts, um, that I believe the Biden administration will move as quickly as it can to reverse and uh, clarify uh, the status of immigrants with, with regard to their ability um, to uh, qualify, for example, for green card status and um, federal health care programs. Uh, there are um, uh, the ability of immigrants to enroll in Affordable Care Act programs can be waived to some degree by the Section 1332 waivers that I mentioned. Uh, and I think that you will see a lot of states and perhaps with uh, support and promotion from the Biden administration looking at those uh, um, changes uh, in the next couple of years. Um, why don't we move on? I think that might be our last slide. Uh, yeah, so... Um, I really appreciate your attention and I'm excited that we have a good bit of time here for questions and discussion. Thank you, Billy. Um, we are now going to pivot to um, answering some questions. Um, if you have a question, could you please insert it in the Q&A box uh, in the middle of your screen at the bottom? That would be really helpful and we'll get to as many as possible today. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention because it's coming up in the chat box is CHF is recording this webinar and we will have it on our website and we'll email it out um, probably next week. The email will go out to anyone who's on the webinar now. And any of the resources can also be found on the website, including more details on I think the really helpful overview really provided on the Congressional Review Act and waivers and things like that. More detail is in the issue brief, which is on our website. So with that, I'm gonna ask a few questions and then we will take some questions from the audience. So Billy, I wanted to talk a bit more about the waivers that you mentioned. Um, you've talked about both the 1332 waiver and the 1115 waivers as opportunities for states to really advance um, initiatives at the state level, including round coverage. Can you talk a bit more about that and give us some examples of maybe approaches other states have done, at, perhaps under either the Trump or the Obama administration and, and what we might um, uh, look forward to um, over the next few years? Sure, thanks, Katie. Um, so uh, starting with section 1332, I noted that under President Obama, many states uh, relied on that waiver pathway to adopt uh, reinsurance programs, the federal reinsurance program under the Affordable Care Act expired. And many states viewed that as a strong tool for helping to stabilize their markets and bring premiums down. Um, the Section 1332 uh, waivers do require uh, budget neutrality uh, so that a state uh, asking for a waiver needs to show that their initiative is not going to cost the federal government more money than it otherwise would have spent. Um, there, it's also, there's also an important a component that um, the, uh, the program that's being initiated via the waiver needs to waive one of the elements of the ACA that is eligible for waiver under section, section 1332. And that may sound kind of you know, intuitively obvious, but it's actually tricky because for example, with the reinsurance program, the provision that states have waived is uh, the single risk pool requirement of the Affordable Care Act. And so there is an argument to be made um, that you are, uh, are creating, layering the market, for example, with a reinsurance program. Um, but it, it is also, I think, an, a, indicative of the fact that if you have a supportive administration that wants to work with states on expanding coverage and protecting care, then you can be creative to some degree in utilizing these waivers to effectuate uh, public policy change. Uh, Section 1115 is primarily is, well, is uh, related to the Medicaid program, and there, while budget neutrality is also expected, there is broader latitude, historically speaking, for states to get things like upfront funding, uh, to expand coverage. So it's, it has been um, argued that you could look at budget neutrality on a person-by-person -person basis, so that if coverage is cheaper per person under the 1115 waiver, uh, then um, it can fly even if you're covering more people and therefore overall it's more expensive to the federal government. Uh, so hopefully that's a little bit more detail that helps, but we we'll look forward to another question. Thank you, Billy. That's helpful. Um, I also wanted to talk about the issue of costs. Um, 
you know, in, in California, the average cost of a family health insurance plan is nearly $20,000 a year, um, which is about a third of the median family income. And in CHF's latest statewide poll, which was published in January, just over half of Californians said they skipped or postponed physical or mental health care due to cost. So I'm hoping um, you can talk a bit about um, what could be done more at the federal level. You mentioned drug pricing, you mentioned surprise billing, and um, what are the um, options for states? How can the federal government uh, support states addressing the issue of cost if the federal government isn't able to do as much there? Sure, thanks Katie. Uh, so this is, this is needless to say a difficult issue. I alluded to this in my, in my preliminary comments. Um, cost is where the rubber meets the road in our healthcare system, spending. Uh, and uh, there are, I think, some good measures on the table, both with regard to drug pricing, um, provider reimbursement, and others. Um, but part of the challenge, and um, maybe just a level set, is we're talking about 20% of our economy. And so when you start talking about meaningful cost control measures, you are, uh, in fact, to some degree, talking about jobs, and you're talking about um, household income, and you're talking about pocketbook issues. Pocketbook issues. The 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 challenge is um, balancing the implications for the healthcare sector and healthcare employees and so forth with the interests of the rest of the the public. Um, and uh, to see a net gain in um, in well being and in um, in household you know, finances through cost control measures. That is not an easy thing. Would we all you know prefer it be easy, and it's not. Uh, certainly not easy politically. I, I, I contend it's also not that easy substantively. Having said all of that, um, there are states moving forward with things like drug reimportation. Um, uh, Florida, Colorado, my hometown uh, state, is uh, are, are moving forward with um, the existing statutory framework that permits that under federal law. We need more guidance and I think support from the federal government to really states to have the assurance they can move forward with such measures without legal challenge. Uh, but there are folks moving in that direction. You've also seen, and we could, I will probably get into public option policy more uh, in the future, but um, there are states looking at uh, regulating prices in the commercial market in a way that they haven't done before, whether it's by bringing in sort of a Medicaid or Medicare orientation or some other mechanism for looking at the existing uh, commercial prices, which are uh, higher than those government programs uh, on average by a substantial degree and trying to bring those down um, that's a very large porn, uh, component of our uh, healthcare costs. But again, um, uh, it, is, it is challenging uh, to get those types of measures over the, over the goal line. Thanks, Billy. Um, I wondered, um, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic response, and obviously that's taking up a, a lot of focus right now with the um, president-elect Biden and his team. Um, can you um, talk a little bit about, there's, there's been an effort for the last several months around um, an, another COVID-related stimulus bill and response package. We also have the um, continuing resolution that is expiring. You kind of mentioned this a little bit at the beginning. Can you talk a bit about the likelihood of something happening in the next um, month or so, or um, are we really looking towards um, once um, President-elect Biden is inaugurated before um, more action can be taken, particularly related to COVID? So uh, the federal government is operating currently under a continuing resolution of the prior year fiscal funding through December 11th. So that is an important date to keep an eye on. It is very possible, bordering unlikely, that that date will be uh, extended on a short-term basis it's sort of the annual, um, you know, um, ceremony of Congress to do this, to set a deadline and then extend it right up until the holidays start to set in at the end of December. Uh, but so that's probably the time frame that we're looking at, though, for Congress to make meaningful progress on a COVID relief package. Uh, I noted that the uncertainty of the, you know, it's, it's one thing, it's challenging enough when you have a transfer of power and you're in a lame duck period. Um, it's even more challenging when there are people disputing what that you know, transfer of power is going to be, and you have two runoff elections that are going to have an impact on the balance of power as well. Uh, so, um, so far, um, we have not seen very promising signals on a relief package. We have seen some convergence over, there's, you think of kind of a graph kind of going up and down in terms of the probability something would come together. There have been moments where they're not that far apart. House Democrats passed a, a package that's in the low two point some trillion dollar range and you had Secretary Mnuchin signaling that he would be willing you know, to, to support something in the high 1.789 range. 
Um, it was unclear where Senate Republicans, uh, the, the Senate, let me say, uh, stood on that. And um, with Senate Majority Leader McConnell taking a, a more a prominent role in those negotiations, uh, while that does bode well if there is an agreement for that getting through the Senate, uh, it may not bode well for getting to an agreement in the first place. So I'm happy to go into more detail there, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Billy. That's helpful. Uh, we've had a question on um, behavioral health and what we might expect in the new administration. I know your issue group includes a little bit, um, but we weren't able to go into it in the slide. So could you talk about that and, and what we've heard from the um, president-elect's campaign and what he might be interested in doing either administratively or legislatively or both? Sure. Yeah. So a couple of things. I'd say one thing that there's recognition in the, in the Biden camp that while we have mental health parity on paper, we don't necessarily have it in practice. I think that they're going to be looking at the effectuation of mental health parity principles uh, in Medicare, Medicaid, throughout uh, federally influenced healthcare programs when they come into office. Um, there is also the opioid epidemic, despite there having been prior rounds of congressional action to address that. I think that there is a recognition that it is still very much a challenge uh, throughout the country. Uh, and that's another thing that uh, President-elect Biden has signaled he's going to prioritize early on. Uh, it's a question of funding. It's a question of workforce. Um, it's a question of awareness and education. There are a lot of different planks uh, to try to get a handle on some of these behavioral health and addiction related issues. Uh, but I, I do think we will see at the very least regulatory action um, and sort of an administration uh, kind of ca uh, educational campaign of sorts to try to uh, reinvigorate attention on these mental and behavioral health issues. Thank you, Billy. Uh, you, um, on the coverage slide, it talks, um, there's a bullet point on um, expanding Medicare, uh, lowering the age of eligibility to 60, and that will require legislative support. Um, can you talk maybe broadly about kind of what are, what's the likelihood that in the next couple of years that um, could pass Congress um, and, and what we might expect there? Sure. Um, and uh, that has been an, an oft repeated uh, component of President elect Biden's campaign platform. And uh, there is, uh, this is one of those things where you poll on it and it gets very broad based public support, um, at least kind of in, in sort of the vacuum of the, of the academic question of whether or not you think it's a good idea to expand Medicaid, co Medicare coverage, excuse me. Um, uh, there are a couple of challenges. One is, first of all, I believe this is a measure that could pass through reconciliation. So if you had a cooperative Congress, uh, it is something you might be able to move through a simple uh, majority vote of the Senate. So that's one thing. Uh, on the other hand, um, and it comes back to cost and it comes back to spending. And even though um, uh, lowering the Medicare eligibility age to 60 uh, would, I, I, I believe, in, in almost every circumstance, improve the affordability of care and access to care for people in that 60 to 65 population, for providers and others, you are, you are taking commercial reimbursement and transferring it to Medicare reimbursement. And so you are gonna be reducing revenues and uh, profitability of some of those operations. And that's again, where we get back to uh, the difficulty with moving more ambitious measures on cost uh, within federal healthcare programs. Thanks, Billy. Um, I, we've got a number of questions around coverage. And so I'm gonna kind of stay in that area for a little bit. Um, uh, somebody's asked a question on the likelihood of addressing um, the family glitch, which um, it, maybe you can explain the family glitch as you're talking about it. And how would that, could that be done regulatorily? Um, it, does it require legislation? Um, what do you think might happen with that this year? Sure. Uh, so just briefly, uh, the family glitch is uh, eligibility for premium subsidies for a household under the Affordable Care Act uh, can be uh, restricted if a member of the household has access to affordable individual coverage from their employer. And so it's sort of an apples and oranges comparison. If, I, if uh, you're at a, an employer who offers individual coverage that is deemed affordable less than I believe 9.8% of your, your income, um, then even if the family coverage is unaffordable, some quotient above that percentage of household income, you can't get, and you and your family cannot get um, Affordable Care Act subsidies for individual market coverage. That is a, is a longstanding um, challenge. We don't know exactly you know, how many people don't have coverage, but I think nationwide, we're probably talking in the millions of people uh, who could avail themselves of subsidies, but for the family glitch. And uh, that is a measure I believe could move through reconciliation. It does require legislation though, and it is gonna be as with anything else that is uh, strengthening, building on, enhancing the Affordable Care Act, 
it's, it's, we can anticipate that it will be partisan and contingent on a cooperative Congress. Thank you, Billy. Um, since we're on um, this topic and we've talked about a number of coverage options that really require legislation, um, could you talk a bit more, um, you know, maybe beyond the 1332 waiver, what are the kinds of things that the um, Biden administration would be able to do via the regulatory process to advance coverage, whether that's related to the pandemic or um, more broadly? Could you talk a, a bit more to that, provide some de more detail around that? Sure. So um, I think that uh, one thing that the Biden administration can do is to allocate full funding, for example, for Affordable Care Act um, outreach and enrollment activities. Uh, that funding was um, curtailed um, by uh, executive you know, decision by the President Trump. Uh, and so we could see, um, you know, more outreach, more enrollment, billboards, you know, all those types of things uh, to help people uh, know what their coverage options are and uh, funding for navigators and so forth and uh, to, to get them uh, enrolled. Um, uh, that is uh, not an insignificant measure. And I think that with regard to waivers um, and with regard to, for example, regulations on, on um, kind of the unfolding implementation of the Affordable Care Act, um, you just, I, I don't think we can quantify the difference between a supportive and um, you know, uh, aggressive administration and finding ways to get people covered, whether it's through the Affordable Care Act or Medicaid or otherwise, um, relative to one that we're uh, expanding that coverage, is, let's suffice it to say, has not been their highest priority. Uh, so I think we're gonna see meaningful changes there, but again, in terms of real dollars and expanding subsidies and some of the other things that are really gonna move the needle of coverage, we're gonna need the support of Congress. Thank you, Billy. Um, I'm going to ask one last question on coverage, and then I think we'll pivot to a few other topics. Um, so somebody has um, sent in a question about um, uh, what are the what's the likelihood of being able to use the 1332 waiver or potentially other, other waivers to advance um, a single payer health system at the state level? Um, certainly, there's been some conversation about that in a number of states, including California. So could you speak to that and, and how um, likely it is to be able to use the waivers to do that? Sure. Um, so, so I would just note that um, uh, Washington State uh, has uh, been moving forward with a public option program um, that is uh, largely contingent on existing commercial coverage options. Uh, they do not intend to apply for a federal waiver, though with a different administration, debt calculation may change. I know that they are also contemplating more ambitious cost control measures for that program. Uh, where a waiver might begin to make more sense because they're generating more federal savings. Um, a key component of the, of the 1332 waiver that I want to add here is that if the state's program is going to save the federal government money, then the federal government will pass back that savings to the state uh, to help fund expanded subsidies, administration of the program, and so forth. So that is a, a, an important, maybe arguably the most important aspect of a 1332 waiver of a state can qualify. With regard to adopting single payer, the, the parameters are that the coverage has to be as robust uh, or more and cost the same or less um, of, in terms of federal dollars. States are, are welcome to put in state dollars if they're able to do that uh, in order to move forward. So that's, that's really the key parameter. And then you have the, the relatively, well, um, uh, a refined list of aspects of the Affordable Care Act that can be waived in a 1332 context. It's it's not all of them, so that's another important thing to look about to look at when you're thinking about a 1332 waiver uh, for a single payer program or anything else. Um, I would add one more thing: is that um, again, whether or not we have a, a cooperative or non-cooperative Congress, um, uh, the idea of a federal public option. Uh, and as, as President-elect Biden has described, which is one that is added to the existing options within the exchange market, uh, perhaps for people who are in states that have not yet expanded Medicaid. Um, uh, uh, President-elect Biden has proposed it also be available to people with employer-sponsored coverage. Um, that is a very, very controversial measure at the federal level. And even if you have a cooperative Congress, I, for one, am skeptical that such a measure would be enacted in the next two years. Uh, so I think there are going to be similar uh, political constraints um, and uh, to some degree substantive constraints, as I mentioned, with the parameters of the waiver program for the Biden administration to be granting waivers that are even more ambitious in terms of um, replacing commercial oriented coverage with government coverage. Uh, so I think you will see a why. I think one thing that I, I would say, and I, I'm 
I'll stop, is that um, one principle I think that the Biden administration will apply is that they would like to see a broad array and flexibility for states as much as permissible under law uh, to pursue expansion, expansion of coverage programs. Uh, so if a state were to come forward with something that is more in the line of single payer, if it complies with the law, obviously I can't predict what the Biden administration would do. There will be a lot of pressure. Yeah, you know, there would be a lot of national attention paid to such a waiver. Um, but I think that their goal would be to, per to grant things that are permissible under the law. Thank you, Billy. So um, we've had some questions come in around surprise billing and um, and why that is a topic. It's it's it, there's bipartisan support, but they have not been able to get to resolution um, in in Washington D.C. And so, can you talk a bit about maybe why that may be the case and um, what we might expect on surprise billing? Obviously, um, Senator Elect Biden has signaled that he'd like to address the issue, um, but can you speak a bit to what we might see in the next year on that topic? Sure. I think this is a particularly frustrating uh, issue for people because, and, and for many members of Congress, uh, you know, in fairness, um, because on the one hand, you have the issue of the, of the kind of universally despised <laughs> phenomenon of getting a, a large, you know, four or five figure bill from a hospital because of something that was completely out of your control that you did not expect. You know, um, on the other hand, the other way that, that uh, we have to look at this issue is that it is a... Um, proxy, a microcosm of the debate between commercial-oriented pricing and government-oriented pricing, because the solutions on the table for surprise billing have to do with having the government um, arbitrate, basically, or set what the reimbursement should be in these circumstances, rather than have the existing commercial rates control. And so that's why when, the, when you get down to the, to the nitty-gritty, uh, this is a complicated issue and more difficult to, to pass a solution than you might expect at first glance. Thank you, Billy. A um, lot of interest around um, drug pricing and addressing the costs of high prescription drugs as well. Um, could you go into a little bit more detail on what we might expect from the Biden administration and how that could potentially impact states' efforts to address um, those same issues um, at the state level? Uh, so again, you have um, seen some proposals in the last four years. Drug reimportation is one, uh, one that, that uh, it, it, it appears that the Trump administration may try to finalize uh, in the next day or so is the International Pricing Index with Medicare, uh, which would look at, at foreign government pricing uh, for prescription drugs and uh, apply those to uh, prescription drugs in the Medicare program, starting with those that are higher volume, higher cost drugs, uh, and, then, and then presumably expanding further from there. Um, one emblem of uh, the sort of democratic position on drug pricing uh, it doesn't certainly speak for the entire party, is H.R. 3, uh, the, um, the House bill uh, that has a wide range of very aggressive, uh, in some cases, drug pricing policies in there. I think there's a lot of questions about how that bill would fare in the Senate, even if it were a, one that wanted to be cooperative, and, and, you know, generally speaking, with the Biden administration. Um, but there, there's, there's definitely a menu there that folks are looking at for what could move forward. Um, and there's uh, uh, the possibility of expanded rebates, uh, both in Medicaid, but also applying rebates to the Medicare or even the commercial market. And there we see proposals that suggest if drug price increases are above a certain threshold, 10%, you name it, then mandatory rebates could be imposed by the federal government. Again, there you have this debate between government involvement in an otherwise commercially oriented price mechanism, and therefore you have controversy and difficulty moving things through. Billy, could you... Um speak a bit more. Um, you certainly in California, there's been an effort to expand Medicaid coverage for um, additional Californians, in, including undocumented um, or young adults who are undocumented and seniors as well. Um, what is the likelihood, um, you know, you mentioned um, some, a few things in your presentation, but what is the likelihood that um, the federal government may be able to address some of these issues around coverage? and or, you know, kind of related the, the idea about immigration reform. And, um, I think then, you know, maybe the next step is if they can't, how supportive do you anticipate this administration will be? What could they do to be supportive to, for states to continue down this path of um, expanding coverage to their entire population? Um, so I do think I'll start kind of at the end and work back. I do think you will see the Biden administration be very supportive of states that want to find creative ways to expand coverage to immigrants of various classes, 
um, and that there that is permitted, as I've noted, under Section 1332 and, and Section 1115 to some degree, uh, you can offer states some flexibility to do that. Um, uh, with regard to legislation, I think that it, you know it is going to be a challenge again, evenly, you know, narrowly divided Congress, whichever way you slice it. Um, and immigration reform has been on the table for some time. I would comment on immigration reform. So, if you are going to see changes to eligibility for federal health care programs uh, for immigrants, I believe it is it is likely to be in the context of broad based immigration reform. I think it is going to be challenging to see that move forward in the context of, of kind of broader ACA improvements, for example. Um, and I would just one more note is that I believe that if um, you had seen a uh, broader um, victory for President Biden's party in the in the 2020 elections, that um, they likely would have prior prioritized issues like immigration, transportation, tax reform, wealth inequity, even racial inequity, above things like um, more ambitious healthcare policy programs, in part because that's what they did in 2009. And, and, and President-elect Biden um, and, and the vast majority of people who will likely be working for him in senior leadership positions you know, were there uh, when that was, was happening and still uh, bear the scars to some degree. And so I think that they would be uh, you know, eager to move on to other issues, COVID notwithstanding, Affordable Care Act, Supreme Court case. And, you know, we seem to not be able to break free of health care. Um, but I just, in terms of their substantive prioritization of these issues, I think they would love to move to immigration reform as soon as they could. Let's talk a little bit, um, Billy, about um, telehealth. Um, particularly with the COVID pandemic, it is we've seen a, um, a lot of support for it. A lot more patients are receiving their care that way. Um, can you talk a little bit to what you think, um, how supportive the administration might be to um, continuing um, the expansions we've seen on telehealth beyond the public health emergency and after the pandemic is over? Generally speaking, there is broad-based support for expanding access to telehealth services. Uh, we have seen during the COVID pandemic that the, um, what's called the originating site restrictions, and other, the long story short is that in Medicare, you really uh, only get consistent access to telehealth services if you're in a, a, a rural and even really extremely rural area. Um, and um, that has been waived so that more people have access, as I noted earlier. And I, there have been uh, Trump administration officials and others who have commented that the cat is sort of out of the bag with telehealth. It's going to be very hard to dial back. Um, I think that as our culture in general has been kind of changing under COVID, medical care has been changing. Patients and caregivers are more comfortable with remote methods of, of delivering and receiving care. Um, on the other hand, you do have these statutory restrictions in place for, in particular, the Medicare program. Uh, that are going to be a barrier. There has been a debate uh, for a long time about the cost benefit of telehealth. And there's some in you know, kind of the healthcare economist camp um, and uh, kind of the, the bean counting category who believe that any expansion of services is gonna cost more money. Uh, so I think you have to, that is gonna, there's gonna be a, a balancing of uh, perhaps expanding telehealth access for higher value services, primary care, uh, chronic you know, disease management, et cetera. Um, and probably uh, less so for other, other elements of care as they try to strike that balance um, regarding the, the cost of expanding programs. That makes sense. Billy, you talk um, in your issue brief quite a bit and a little bit in the slide deck about the role of CMMI in terms of testing new kind of models of care, um, payment, things like that. I wonder if you um, could talk maybe briefly um, talk about what is CMMI um, and um, how it's been used to test these models and what you think um, we might see under a Biden administration in terms of using um, that to test new and innovative models of care. Sure. So uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, CMMI, is a, a, a child of the Affordable Care Act, um, and it includes broad authority uh, for the federal government to waive any aspect of Medicare law um, and most aspects of Medicaid law and with the primary purpose of testing new me uh, mechanisms of delivering care and paying for care that ultimately should bring down cost and improve quality. And we've seen dozens and dozens of, of initiatives, um, bundled payment systems, uh, accountable care organizations, uh, medical homes, and all uh, different methodologies for payment that, that either um, replace or um, uh, are intended to, to, to influence the incentives of a fee-for-service oriented system, which is a kind of our historical norm, at least in the Medicare program. 
Um, and uh, their two programs have to at least demonstrate an expectation for savings. Uh, and the majority of programs in the past have been optional for providers to participate in. And those that are mandatory have proven more effective in saving money and improving quality. Obviously, those are more controversial because um, you're, you're bringing in folks who wouldn't otherwise volunteer to participate. I think you are going to see the trend continue, though, in favor of more mandatory programs. Um, I would note one in particular relative to drug pricing before uh, President, uh, the end of President Obama's uh, administration, they tried to do some aggressive measures on drug pricing and Medicare via CMMI authority. They eventually had to pull that demonstration back because of the political controversy and the threats of a legal challenge because of that expansive use or, or what was perceived to be an expansive use of CMMI authority. So there, as, as always, there are policy and political balances that need to be taken into account when you talk about um, advancing CMMI demonstrations. Um, thank you. That's helpful. Um, and I, I think we have probably time for a couple more questions. Um, Billy, you mentioned during um, your presentation about how um, uh, Congress and the administration could try and mitigate the impacts of the ACA by passing um, legislation in advance of any decision. Could you talk a bit more to um, how Congress and the president might be able to respond kind of post a decision, what the opportunities might be to engage there. Um, so we kind of get the full sense of the landscape there. Uh, so the, the first question that we, we would need to know is, you know, how uh, expand, if, if the Supreme Court strikes down the individual mandate, which for now, let's just assume that they do. If they don't, then we all move on. If they do, then the question is the issue of severability and what other elements of the, of the ACA um, would be struck, struck down. And the uh, position of the, the plaintiffs, those, those who would undo the ACA, is that, and they said this during the oral argument, at very least it would be the three-legged stool of the ACA, and that's the mandate, the premium subsidies, and the protection for people with pre-existing conditions. So those are very, very core components of the ACA that are responsible for the coverage of 10 million or more people, are responsible for bringing down the cost of care for, for many million more. Uh, and so if those were to be struck down, um, one thing that I believe that we can predict is some transitional period. For one thing, the Supreme Court might actually, if they, if they say that it's not just the mandate, they might go down to the, to the federal district court to parse out with more hearings and more uh, debate which aspects of the ACA should stand and which should not. I also think the Supreme Court would require some sort of transitional, you know, some, some effectuation date out in the future to in part give Congress time to react, but also just to give all of us in the market time to react. I am not optimistic that Congress, whatever its makeup is going to be, is going to be able to reinstitute things like the protections for people with pre-existing conditions, as popular as, as all members of Congress say that those are and that they support them. Again, that's a 60 vote threshold for that measure. And again, it's it, it, as a standalone measure, broad support. As an element of the Affordable Care Act, very controversial. So um, I think we should, you know, people like me are just hoping the Supreme Court <laughs> disposes of this because it's not going to be pretty if they strike that down. That's the short story. Yeah, I agree. That makes sense. Um, so, Billy, I wonder if you could, um, you know, there's been concern that um, uh, the, the Trump administration will issue kind of final rules um, as it's going out the door on a, a range of issues. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how um, the Biden administration may go about um, basically eliminating those rules as you know potentially right out of the gate once um, President elect Biden is is sworn in? Yes. So uh, when a new administration comes in, um, any rule that has not been finalized within sixty days um, of of that new administration uh, taking power can be there can be a hold placed on it, and ultimately it can be changed, revised, even rescinded. Uh, under the power of the new administration. So November 20th, I mentioned the International Pricing Index rule is the magic number uh, for the Trump administration to try to finalize policies that would make it harder, but not impossible for, the, for a new administration to reverse. So that 60 day look back period is just again, to, to put a hold on things that have not been finalized. Things that have been finalized, the challenge is you have to issue new rulemaking. You can reverse it, you can change it. Um, you can always change regulations. None of them are, are fixed in stone but you just have to go through the same notice and comment rulemaking period, which can take several months at least. Thank you. 
And I think we have time for one last question. So um, this one's going to look a little bit more ahead. Um, summing it up, you know, obviously the pandemic is going to be an immediate um, focus and concern in the early days of the um, uh, President Obama, President Biden's new administration. Um, could you speak a little bit more to um, what we might expect, say, in the first six months or even the first year? So looking beyond the pandemic, which hopefully we can soon, mm -hmm. um, you know, what other things might um, a, a President um, Biden be able to accomplish in that first six months or first year? Sure. So I'd say, number one, say the obvious COVID will be the, will be the primary focus um, until there's some I, you know, shared understanding that, that the pandemic is under some degree of control, that there is some degree of, of rationality to how vaccines will be distributed and paid for testing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you have a non-cooperative uh, Senate and Congress, then I think they'll be looking at issues like transportation. Um, they might try to look at something like immigration. Um, they're going to be looking at things that are going to, uh, probably things that are in that 60 volt threshold arena, because they're going to want to do things in a bipartisan basis if that is, is that's the, the makeup of the Congress. If you have a cooperative Congress, you could see an effort to move some things through, through reconciliation. I think you would see some healthcare measures. You would see some effort to uh, rescind some of the Trump um, tax cuts uh, that were enacted during his administration and other sort of wealth and equity measures um, are probably highest on the list uh, if you're looking at a recon reconciliation bill. One thing that we saw, I think it was yesterday, um, is an emphasis on climate change. Uh, I, I don't think that, that you're going to see that if you have a non-cooperative Congress, uh, but you could see some movement perhaps in the tax arena if you have a Senate that wants to move forward on some climate change measures. And I would, I would look at the, the Biden administration. There's a lot with the EPA, things that they can change from the last four years and ways to move forward um, with regulation um, of uh, trying to restrict carbon emissions and so forth that I think are going to be leveraged uh, to the hilt uh, by an administ uh, Biden administration. Great. Thank you, Billy. Um, well, we're almost at the end of our hour. Uh, I have a few announcements to make. As I said earlier, the recording for this webinar, uh, the issue brief and these slides will all be available on CHCF's website. Um, I anticipate the recording will be up probably by the end of the week. And we will email all of that information out to everybody who has registered to attend today. Um, if you can please fill out the survey that'll pop up as soon as this webinar concludes, that's really helpful for us. It helps us plan future programming and events, and so I encourage you to fill that out if you can. And not last but not least, I really want to thank Billy for taking the time today. Um, this was a really helpful overview. We had a lot of great questions and obviously engagement in this and really just appreciate your taking the time to do that today. Um, and I'd also like to thank everyone for attending and for the great questions that we received. We were able to get to not every one of them, but to most of them. And so thank you everybody for your time today. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. Thanks everyone.